The first thing I'm going to tell you about the toughest mission I was ever on. On the day of uh, this particular mission, we were briefed by our intelligence officer, and he said, you're going to see more flak today than you've ever seen in your whole life. He said, the Japanese are putting all their best men, their best uh, anti-aircraft equipment down at a little place called Prom. And uh, it was only uh, about 100 miles north of Rangoon, which was then the capital of uh, uh, Burma. So uh, with that in mind, he said, uh, in case you run into problems, the British have retaken an airport up further north, and you can come and uh, they'll help you. Now, Burma is a fairly narrow country. There's a river that runs north and south in it called the Irrawaddy River. And uh, the, this airport was near the Irrawaddy River, and uh, we took a copy of all the information, and uh, we took off and flew, came up to altitude, and we got close to Prome, our target. We kicked a little bit to the right and then turned to the left and about five miles from the target. And boy, I looked up from the, I was up in the nose of the airplane, plexiglass, and there was flak. I'm telling you, there was flak all over the place. Anyway, we get close to the target and the pilot uh, opens the bomb bay and we unload the bombs. And just as the bombs left, the right engine went on fire. And he said, pilot to crew, right engine on fire, I'm gonna cut off the fuel. So he cut off the fuel to the right engine. And uh, then he said, pilot to crew, I'm gonna try restarting that engine. And uh, he did, and the fire was bad. I mean, it, it was worse. And uh, he said, fuel, all fuel cut off to the right engine. So B-25 had two engines. So we had one engine left, and pilot said, uh, pilot to navigator, where is this uh, uh, airport that the uh, British have retaken? I said, well, stay on the left side of the Irrawaddy River, and uh, don't go to the right. There could be some stragglers, and we'd get shot. And uh, it's about 80 to 90 miles from here. And uh, so it was, it was a, <laughs> the feeling I had is I watched that one good engine all the way up to, to the British place. We finally got up there, and the British uh, said, uh, we, we can put you up, but we're kind of disappointed. We didn't expect a big silver airplane we thought it would be a camouflaged airplane. And we said, hey, no Japanese had ever come to the, to the little place we had called Fenny. And uh, it was way out of the way for them. And they said, okay. So they put our airplane in the, in the trees and everything. And they were treating us pretty good. And uh, they finally, time to go to go to bed after meal. They took us to a tent, and we had uh, three foxholes outside the tent, and they pointed that out. They said, uh, in case you hear a siren going off, there's a full moon tonight, and no telling what the Japanese might try, but get in, jump in those foxholes. So uh, we're going along, and I'm sleeping pretty good. And all of a sudden, I hear a siren. And it was loud. So the three of us jump in these foxholes. And uh, we're waiting in the foxhole. And I finally, I put my head up and looked out. And you won't believe what I'm going to tell you. The British had an outdoor movie. 
and they were showing a, a movie. <laughs> and it was, it was a John Dillinger movie. <laughs> and John Dillinger was escaping from a theater yeah. and, and the police were chasing him and the fire uh, sirens were going full bore. <laughs> Anyway, we, we, we heard about that quite often. <laughs> we did, in about a week, we, uh, we got the parts were available for our uh, airplane and it was fixed and we're back home. Uh, I, I'd also like to tell you about a ne something you probably never heard. Uh, has anybody ever heard of a cannon on an airplane? Have you? Did you know there was one on a B-25? No. Oh. The B-25 has two models, one with the plexiglass nose. It has two 50 caliber machine guns in there, which I, when not navigating and we were strafing, it was my job to use them. It was also my job. We had uh, on a B-25H, H for Harry, had a 75 millimeter cannon running under the uh, pilot's seat. So when we got to the target, uh, I'd get up from the co-pilot seat and step down to load the cannon. Put the microphone back up. The microphone. Oh, yep. and uh, the 75 millimeter transfer, uh, translates to uh, in the English uh, measurements, three inches in diameter. The shell was 18 inches long and it weighed about 15 pounds. And uh, there was a compartment right, the breech was uh, right below a compartment where the shells were kept. I would take a shell and I would put it in the breech and it would close automatically. And uh, I was standing and we would, I looked at the speedometer, we were doing 185 miles per hour and it was the darnest sensation. It, when that gun went off, it felt like we were standing still, but we weren't. And before you knew it, there was black smoke in the cockpit. The, it, the, uh, propellant is a black powder and the empty shell came dropped off the back and uh, the, the pilot, oh, I tapped the pilot on the shoulder and he fired the gun. And uh, that was the first software known to mankind. Anyway, the, as, soon as, as soon as that black smoke cleared out and whoever designed that airplane did did a wonderful job. They uh, cleared, cleared, the, uh, cleared the air in no time. And I would get another 75 millimeter shell and put it in the breech and tap the pilot on the shoulder and would fire it. And one, one uh, mission we got off in a, a single, uh, attack on a target, uh, four shells. And it, w it was quite a, quite a thing. I'm just mentioning this because not, I don't know of another airplane that had a 75 millimeter cannon in it. Uh, I'd like to now tell you a little bit about uh, some of the, uh, work we did with the British 14th Army. They were coming down from the north and they would give us targets that they wanted us to hit. And they said, uh, we'd like you to, uh, if possible, send a squadron of people down into, into Burma and live along the, along the Irrawaddy River. So when we need something, Instead of getting you to hit the target the next day, you'd be able to go hit it within 30 minutes. And uh, 
we we did that, and during the the month of May, I flew 89 hours, and we uh, I flew uh, all but five days, and we uh, had eight, I had eight uh, eight combat missions, and when we were all through, we went back to our base in small base in Feni, India. And uh, at the end, beginning of June, they had decided to pull us out of Burma and put us back in, in a rearward base in uh, India. And we didn't mind that. The only thing is they were training us in a brand new airplane. And they, it was called the A-26 Invader. It was, it was like the B-25 in a lot of respects, although it was single tail and uh, it was faster. But the thought that went through my mind, why are they, why are they doing this to us? The, the European war was going great. Everything was done. Why, why do they have to train me? Well, I, fi I found out why I was, that was done. And I'd like to relate a little bit about what, what happened when I was over there and the A-bombs went off. <laughs> I, I'd like to say this, that uh, we knew, or ha Harry Truman, our president, knew that he had a big decision coming up. Should he use those A-bombs? They're gonna kill thousands and thousands of people, innocent people, or should I refrain? So he called his top generals together and admirals, and he said, I'd like, as soon as you can get it to me, I'd like to know how many men would we lose if we attacked Japan with the forces you now have, just as they are, no, he didn't, of course, didn't want to mention he knew about an atomic bomb. And uh, he, in about a week, he got the answer from his top command. And uh, the answer was, if we attack Japan with the forces we now have, you're going to lose a million men. And that's why they were training me in that brand new airplane. I would have been one of them. But... Uh, I pity what poor Harry Truman was going through. So he, he made the decision, he'd use the bomb, and the first bomb that he used was uh, a little boy, it was called, on uh, August, the, August the 6th, little boy went, was dropped and it landed right in the middle of Hiroshima. 80 to, 80 to 100,000 people were killed by that bomb. But I'm sure that he felt that he could not endanger a million Ameri American lives. And uh, the Japanese, after that first bomb dropped, did not surrender. They had no thought of surrendering. So three days later, the 9th of August, the second bomb came over. The flight came out and it had a target which was clouded over. So it could not drop the bomb. And their alternate target was Nagasaki. And they came to Nagasaki and they could barely see Nagasaki. But they went ahead and dropped the bomb and they killed 35,000 people. So uh, it was quite a while before the Japanese officially surrendered, what was about the, I'd say about the 20, 20th of August. The Japanese premier said he would unconditionally accept the surrender terms of the Americans. And General MacArthur was uh, put in charge of the American force that and uh, anyway, I was there and I thought, oh boy, 
I'm going to get to go home. And uh, just as that happened, we got an urgent message from a very, the Air Transport Command, they fly C-54s, which was a big transport, four-engine airplane. They, need, they said, we need every navigator we can get. We got to take Chiang Kai-shek's uh, army from uh, Kunming to uh, Shanghai, and uh, we have to do it just as as soon as we can. So uh, I was on the first flight that went from Kunming to Shanghai, and we had uh, 85 Chinese troops. And the first guy to get on was a little guy, and he had a big alarm clock, <laughs> and he had a little bugle. But anyway, we got them all on, and we flew up, and we landed at Shanghai. And uh, after we got out of the plane, a, a sergeant came up in the Jeep, and he said, uh, our runway lights are out. You're going to gonna, you're gonna have to go in town and uh, stay at a hotel. We fixed it. Gonna, gonna take you to the finest hotel in town. And uh, I'll pick you up at 6.30 in the morning. Anyway, the two, the pilot and the co-pilot of the C-54 were in the Jeep. The sergeant was driving and I was in and we were all wearing our khakis. Anyway, we're going down and the streets were lined with, with Chinese troops, Chinese tr civilians. And they were shouting, General MacArthur, General MacArthur. <laughs> so they start giving us little pieces of paper to sign. So I signed General MacArthur. <laughs> anyway, we get in town, we clean up, and we go down, and it was a fine hotel. We ate and we drank, and we uh, went to pay, and they said, no pay from you. You've done a wonderful thing for us. You, you, you cannot pay us. So we would say, well, thank you. Anyway, the pilot, the co-pilot, and myself, we each had a room. It was the finest room in the hotel. And uh, when uh, the time came in the morning, we went down to pay the bill. And the guy behind the uh, desk there said, no bill for you. You've done wonders for us. We appreciate what you've done, and there's, there's no charge. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Anyway, we flew back, and after that uh, trip, I made another trip, and then a, a third trip. And how many men we got to Shanghai, I don't know, but it must have been a lot because it, this was, the C-54 was not the only one. The, I don't know how many there were, but the reason that everybody wanted troops, Chiang Kai-shek's troops, up in Shanghai is they were afraid of the Russians. The Russians were just above Shanghai, and I, they, they were worried that the Russians might make a move and try to grab sh Shanghai. So anyway, uh, everything ended good, and I went back to my base. And when I got back there, uh, I had one fellow that I used to fly with a lot, and I said, Bob, how are things going? He said, well, we've got to take these brand new airplanes to Munich, Germany. And uh, our, our orders read, delivered to Schleisheim Airport, which was right outside Munich, and proceed immediately after delivery of airplanes to the United States. So we, I felt pretty good about that. <laughs> so we flew across the Mediterranean, we stopped and refueled at Rome, and then went, went up to Schleisheim. And we get up to Schleisheim, 
and uh, land at the airport. And uh, the next day, next morning, the colonel who was in charge of the uh, outfit at Schleisheim, he got all of us together that flew ver these brand new airplanes up to him. And uh, he said, I hear you want to know when you're going to go home. And we said, yeah, our orders say you're going home. He said, well, see, your orders say CBI. That patch I have is a CBI stand patch, and it stands for China, China, Burma, India. He said, you can't go home because those orders were written in CBI, and you're not in the CBI any longer. You're now in Europe. <laughs> and you, you're going home according to a point system. And we said, what is a point system? And we found out that they had somehow come up with a system where you got so many points for every year of service at, in the States. If you went out of the States, you got so many more points for a year of service. For every medal you had, you got so many points. And uh, it just went on and on. Well, I, I had the Distinguished Flying Cross, and I had two air medals. And uh, I don't know, but I, I had a total of 85 points. Mm -hmm. So we were stuck in uh, Schleisheim. A bad part of being in Schleisheim, something gruesome we saw, there was a, the German, there was a place called Dakar, where the Jewish, the, the Germans killed thousands and thousands of Jews. And Bob Pearson and I, we went to see that. And uh, it, it, was, it was terrible. Anyway, uh, that pretty, I don't know how much time I've taken. Plenty of time? Anyway, uh, when it, Christmas time came, Bob was, uh, said to me, he says, Art, why don't we go over, take a trip to England and then to Scotland? And uh, I said, that's great. Bob, Bob loved to gamble and he, <laughs> he played poker all the time. Anyway, we went to a USO in England and uh, while he was playing poker and everything, a request came in from an English family. Could you have, do you have any Americans who are gonna be all alone this Christmas? If you do, we'd like to have them come out and have spend the night with us and then Christmas Day spend, uh, we'll feed them and all that. Anyway, they treated us wonderfully. Uh, when I got home from, after I got home after the war, I fixed up a nice bag of food for the people who were so good to me and I sent it over and a month later, I got a letter back from them, and he said, please don't send any more food. Everything you sent us was taxed. <laughs> so I felt terrible. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway Pearson and I, we went up to Scotland, and one of the beneficiaries we had is that uh, being officers, we got a, a bottle of of whatever we wanted. And we each had a bottle of scotch. <laughs> we had a very, very pleasant New Year's up in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> we got back to our, after that we went back to our air, uh, air base in Germany. And it was not until many, many m months later that we got got to go and we did not fly home. We were taken to Le Havre, which was right above where the, where the British troops were during World War. During, well, we were down at Omaha Beach, our people. They were there and we were in a, a tent on the beach for two weeks. And finally, finally, Henry, uh, Henry, 
he, he built ship, ships out in the West Coast and he was building them at the rate of one a day. The ship that came over to pick us up was really a small, small boat and everything. But uh, we were glad to get off the beach after spending two weeks there. And we got on that boat and uh, a trip that was supposed to take six days ended up taking eight days. And uh, finally, it, uh, we got to see the Statue of Liberty and went down to uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey, and passed through a processing center. And uh, that's the end of my story. <laughs> I'm fully aware that my adulthood has been spent. My get up and go has got up and went. But I think with a the, with the grin of all the grand places my get up has been. The older the fiddle, the sweeter the tune. <laughs>